Women with PCOS have been found to have more intestinal permeabilities. There's actually been some small interesting studies that have been done that have microbial balance in the gut and the severity of PCOS symptoms and the severity of the excess androgens. What research is finding is that when there is more of that dysbiosis and we have a lot of that inflammatory dysbiotic bacterial overgrowth, it is associated with higher levels of androgens and more severe PCOS types. Jillian, I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, as you know, you were the first guest ever to talk about PCOS, ever. I'm super jazzed to be the the first person to talk about PCOS. We have a, a lot to dive into. I know we do. So let's talk about what PCOS is, especially for listeners who are not quite familiar with that acronym. Um, I think it's always important to ground the conversation. So what is PCOS? So PCOS uh, stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And PCOS is a complex hormone and metabolic disorder that impacts an estimated one in 10 women in the US and potentially more. And PCOS is, is not a disease. So PCOS is a syndrome, which means it's essentially diagnosed by um, a collection or a constellation of different symptoms, and it can really manifest uh, differently in each individual. And does this impact women, men, young girls? Like who, who ends up with PCOS? PCOS is a condition that um, predominantly impacts women, and it's it's most well known or talked about as a fertility disorder. So we often talk about it when it comes to um, fertility, because oftentimes with PCOS, women have um, irregular cycles or issues with ovulation. But ultimately, uh, PCOS is something that impacts the body systemically. So it impacts, you know, the gut, the skin, um, the digestive system, the cardiovascular system. So it's really, you know, a, a systemic condition and not not just a fertility disorder, although um, it can significantly impact fertility. So what I'm hearing from you is that if you have been told or if you possibly believe that you have PCOS, you shouldn't just necessarily stop at the I have a fertility issue. You should realistically start looking for other areas where there could be would you call would you in this case say there are like comorbidities or conditions that can arise at the same time as something else that you're experiencing Absolutely. I refer to it as that. And I'd, I'd also just highlight the fact that there's a lot of different symptoms that women can experience that are associated with PCOS. Um, however, they're not often being given that information in terms of, hey, this might be connected to your PCOS and really all of these you know, symptoms and systems in the body are interconnected. Um, oftentimes, if I am working with an individual and we're talking about their digestive symptoms or their you know, skin issues and we tie it back to their PCOS, they're like, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea that these things were possibly you know, kind of part of the PCOS dynamic. So who diagnosis is that so you said it was a syndrome is this a diagnosis that you're given by a doctor or is this something that you can um, work with someone and they or is there a test for this like how do you find out or how do you figure out that you have PCOS great question so Typically, um, either an endocrinologist, a gynecologist, or maybe a PCP is going to uh, diagnose PCOS or investigate for a PCOS diagnosis. And really, um, PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. And there is definitely some, some controversy over, you know, diagnostic criteria, but currently the most accepted, you know, kind of diagnostic criteria is the Rotterdam criteria, which basically states that if you have two of the following three, then you qualify for a PCOS diagnosis. So those three things being um, absent or irregular cycles, 
that would be ovulatory dysfunction, um, androgen excess confirmed uh, either clinically or chemically. Androgen excess meaning um, this category of hormones that we have, these androgens are often elevated in women with PCOS, and this often drives clinical symptoms like cystic acne, head hair loss, unwanted hair growth. Um, and then the third uh, criteria being polycystic appearing ovaries, which essentially means having large numbers of of immature follicles on the ovaries. So if you have two of those three, you meet the criteria for a PCOS diagnosis. And I will say it can often be uh, challenging for women to get that diagnosis. Some providers are not always willing to do some of that deeper investigative work to confirm the diagnosis. And oftentimes, uh, women might be on birth control, so we have no idea what their cycles look like, but they're experiencing all the classic PCOS symptoms. But, you know, we're, we're not able to kind of fully evaluate, um, you know, all of those pieces. So, you know, getting a diagnosis, I always say, is is important and helpful if you're able to do that. However, if you experience a lot of PCOS-like symptoms and, you know, all of these things really resonate with you, you can still work on, you know, supporting the different factors that drive these symptoms, even if you don't have the label of, you know, PCOS as the diagnosis. This episode is brought to you by my skincare line, Dermaquel. The beauty of these skincare products are that they are especially crafted for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues based on my research and clinical experience from my private practice. They focus on organic ingredients that are clean like zinc, aloe, and hemp oil that support and calm rashed, dry, angry skin. There's no unnecessary chemicals or additives that can further dry out your skin or mess with your hormones. And I'm so excited for you to add these creams into your routine. Check them out at quellshop.com and use a coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. And actually, I, I just thought of a question that you're, as you're saying this, um, how would someone go about finding out if they have a more cyst-like appearance of the ovary? Is, is that that requires certain tests to be run? or And I assume that means that the doctor has to be willing to run that. Yes. So that has to be confirmed via ultrasound. So um, there does have to be that, you know, actual procedure that happens, which again, not all providers dive into and investigate. Um, but I do think that, you know, if we suspect PCOS, it's important to have that full workup and to really understand what, what we're working with. And I want to point out too, that, you know, because PCOS manifests differently in each individual, not every woman is going to have, you know, those polycystic appearing ovaries. So you could have, you know, normal um, appearing ovaries and normal functioning ovaries, but you could still have PCOS, but sort of a different presentation of it. I always think of the blood sugar issue associated, at least from what I've read with PCOS. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of, um, I guess, blood sugar slash maybe metabolic type syndrome picture that sometimes I, I think can show up in those with PCOS? I would say that blood sugar issues, specifically insulin resistance. So um, for anyone out there that's not familiar with insulin resistance, essentially this is when the, um, our, the cells in our body are resistant to the hormone insulin. Insulin being that hormone that helps usher glucose sugar um, into our cells to you know be used for energy. So um, a lot of women, it's estimated that like 75% or more of women with PCOS have some degree of insulin resistance resistance. And the high levels of, of insulin are what stimulate the theca cells on the ovaries to produce excess amounts of androgen hormone. So the testosterone, um, you know, and then we also have our um, DHEA, DHEAS, which is, you know, ovarian adrenal. But um, insulin is, is a big driver of androgen excess. And it's also a big driver to your point of metabolic issues that are associated with PCOS. So so, um, 
a lot of women will experience um, shifts with weight, a lot of rapid shifts with weight without even, you know, changing anything with their diet or lifestyle. Um, uh, inflammation is a big uh, kind of classic characteristic of PCOS as well. And that chronic low grade inflammation uh, dynamic, it's you know, kind of like what what came first, the chicken or the egg in terms of the insulin or the uh, inflammation, and there's sort of that cyclical relationship there. But um, insulin resistance and blood sugar issues is super, super common in women with PCOS. So if someone thinks that they might be having blood sugar issues, and they think after listening to this, they might, this might explain a lot, is there a way that you recommend someone at least kind of, I guess, confirm that there could be an insulin resistance? Like if you're looking at a, uh, one of your client's labs, is there a certain set of labs that might help show this? Are they doing like uh, one of the CGM, the continuous glucose monitors? I mean, I don't think most doctors are going to prescribe them if they don't think you have diabetes. So what, how does somebody figure out that they're having an insulin resistance issue in the first place? Typically, um, through a combination of, you know, some basic blood sugar labs. So um, I'll, I'll always recommend right off the bat, you know, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, uh, hemoglobin A1C, um, and, and using that information in conjunction with the actual, you know, symptoms an individual is experiencing. And oftentimes, there's a lot of, a lot of outward um, symptoms associated with that insulin resistance and, and you know, blood sugar dysregulation. Um, even things like, um, you know, feeling really, you know, tired and lethargic after after meals, um, feeling like you're riding a blood sugar roller coaster in terms of, um, you know, really erratic um, uh, hunger, um, you know, experiencing a lot of uh, mood issues, um, anxiety, uh, difficulty sleeping, frequent urination. So there's clinical symptoms that we can look at in conjunction with with labs. And what I will say, too, is that I, I consider balancing blood sugar kind of step number one for anyone that is looking to support their hormones, support their gut, um, regardless of what their their labs are saying. Um, so I think for for most women, it's going to be important to kind of build a supportive foundation, you know, with their nutrition and lifestyle that supports balanced blood sugar. Um, and once we kind of get that foundation in place, we have labs, we assess clinical symptoms, that's where we can get a sense of, okay, you know, what, what is the, the degree of insulin resistance here? Um, do we need to bring in more micro strategies? Do we need to explore something like a CGM that would really tell us about that, um, you know, kind of personal glucose insulin response to, to different foods? So I, I never recommend a CGM for someone r right off the bat. I think that more more nitty gritty data is is valuable, more valuable when we have a solid foundation in place with the basics, you know, meal frequency, meal composition, um, and we're trying to like really tweak and fine tune. I I was curious about if there is possibly you because you said there's a lot of other body connections that play a role in this. Is there any research that you've seen or that you work on with your clients that maybe has to do with connections within the GI tract and what could maybe push PCOS <laughs> forward to, to progress this syndrome? I would say, I mean, gut, uh, gut health, digestive health is just a, a hot area of research, um, as you know, in general. But with PCOS specifically, this is a, a big area um, you know, that is hot in terms of lots of research coming out, which is exciting. And um, gut imbalances are being investigated as kind of a root cause driver or, you know, dynamic with PCOS. And what research is telling us is that um, women with PCOS compared to women without PCOS um, tend to have more gut imbalances, specifically um, uh, dysbiosis or just general imbalances with, you know, healthy commensal and, you know, bad or, you know, dysbiotic bacteria. Um, and then also uh, women with PCOS have been found to have more intestinal permeability. So um, a breakdown with that gut barrier that's so important for, you know, our gut health and our, our systemic health. Um, there's actually been some uh, small interesting studies that have been done that have looked at microbial balance in the gut and the severity 
of PCOS symptoms and um, the severity of the excess androgens. And what research is finding is that when there is more of that dysbiosis and we have a lot of that, um, you know, inflammatory dysbiotic bacterial overgrowth, it is associated with higher levels of and androgens and more severe PCOS types. Um, and there was actually, I'm like forgetting all the details of the study, but there was a small study, um, animal study done that actually had, um, you know, animals, uh, animal models with PCOS that they did fecal transplants from, you know, non PCOS animals and their androgen levels, uh, normalized with the fecal transplant, which is pretty wild. Wow. That is wild. You're right. That yeah. is, that is, wow. So interesting. The things that are on the horizon that could potentially be options for people. Um, I, I was wondering as we're talking about this, and I think it's worthwhile to ask, do you feel from either research or just from your clinical experience, like there it could also maybe be a genetic component to this? Absolutely. There is is definitely a genetic component to this. Um, and we do know that fetal exposure to high androgens um, increases the risk of high androgens and PCOS in, you know, offspring. So there is absolutely a genetic component there. Um, there's also a lot of research coming out in the realm of endocrine disruptors and, you know, the the role in, you know, the development and the progression of, of PCOS. Um, so there's a lot of different really interesting things that are, you know, coming coming to light um, that I think is just really helpful for supporting women with PCOS more effectively. Yeah, you mentioned endocrine disruptors. Are there any big ones that you recommend clients at least be aware of or possibly avoid that could be helpful if you do have PCOS? So with endocrine disruptors and PCOS, the the majority of the, the data that we have is around, um, you know, BPA and other, you know, BPs. So this is going to be a, um, a chemical that's found um, or used in a lot of plastics. So women with PCOS have been found to have higher amounts of, um, you know, BPA in uh, their body when compared to women that uh, don't have PCOS. So... I, I will say that's where, you know, we have a lot of data with some of the other um, endocrine disruptors that are common. There, there isn't as much research. So I think it's, it's helpful to think about endocrine disruptors as a whole. But definitely, I think um, plastics is where I, you know, recommend women start and just sort of assessing what their exposure is. And um, I always like to, to point out and emphasize that, you know, we, we live in a world where we're not going to eliminate exposure to all of these things. And that's not the point. Um, but, you know, we can thoughtfully Fully minimize our exposure and make some, you know, significant changes over time um, that really support our health. So, you know, drinking out of plastic water bottles, um, you know, plastic food containers. Uh, I, I emphasize in particular things that are touching, you know, the liquids we drink, the foods that we eat, and you know, we're actually putting in our body. Um, the other thing that I, I uh, call out a lot with endocrine disruptors and PCOS is um, phthalates or synthetic fragrance. Um, and, you know, that can be a big issue as well. So, you know, assessing personal care products, cleaning products, um, and just making some swaps over time to, to kind of minimize the exposure there. Do you also, are you on the camp? I, I mean, I just don't like to touch those receipts that you get. Do Ugh. you feel like those two are better to say, forget it? I'm good. I don't yes. need my receipt. I'm so glad you brought that up and I'm, I can't believe I missed that. So yeah, that, that's a big one and, and, you know, can be a fairly easy way to, to minimize our exposure. So, um, yeah, asking for either declining the receipt, asking for an electronic receipt, definitely a great easy way to, um, you know, minimize exposure to those BPs. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the skin manifestations of PCOS. I think that, you know, the, obviously the show is focused around skin. And as many of my listeners know, there can be other underlying factors that can absolutely be part of your picture, part of your journey that may like maybe the skin issue is actually pointing to something, right? Pointing to something else going on under the surface. So what would be some skin manifestations of PCOS? 
the the most kind of common skin manifestation is is acne um typically cystic acne um and oftentimes that's around the jawline and that's associated with that um the excess androgens that i was mentioning um there are other skin conditions as well that are uh, really common um, in PCOS. So eczema being another one. Um, keratosis pilaris is another one. Um, I never say the name of the, uh, this right. You're uh, probably going to laugh. The um, anthosis, you know, I'm talking about the um, A-N. Asanthosis nigricans. Asanthosis nigricans. Um, that may be it. I that is not yeah. a skin condition I have a lot of experience with, and we have so not mentioned the, on the show. So uh, perfect, perfect. So I can you know I can say it however I want. People, you know maybe people won't notice I'm butchering it, but anyway, the the asanthosis nigricans or A N as I like to you know abbreviate um, is. Uh, dark velvety skin patches, um, darkening of the skin will often be like behind the neck. Um, you know, uh, that's probably the most common place we see it, but that's uh, usually a direct product of, of insulin resistance. So that's a common one. Um, skin tags are another common one. Um, sub, uh, seboric uh, dermatitis, another one. And really at the end of the day, when you, when you think about kind of the core root causes or the dynamics that are commonly driving, you know, symptoms for women, it makes sense that women with PCOS are experiencing more skin issues, right? So we have the blood sugar and insulin issues. Um, we have the gut imbalances, we have the chronic low grade inflammation. And then um, women with PCOS often commonly have uh, cortisol and adrenal issues. And all of all of these things, um, as I know you talk about um, in a lot of depth in in the podcast, um, can drive these uh, conditions in a big way. Yeah, I actually, as you were listing that out, I was also curious about melasma. Do you see melasma? I will say I do see melasma in PCOS, but just based on my clinical experience, I don't, I don't see it in a disproportionate way compared to non PCOS clients that I work with, um, for, and this, this speaks to kind of the, the bio individuality piece and kind of how PCOS manifests differently in each individual. Some women do have, um, estrogen issues and, uh, with PCOS and that's kind of part of their, their PCOS picture. That's where I tend to see more melasma. Um, other women don't have the same issues. Um, so I, I would say I see it less, but I do see it. So one question that someone might have is also, what is the difference between how your doctor would approach PCOS versus the more integrative approach? Is there a difference between the two? I mean, I guess let, let's just hear what is kind of the difference and is there a difference in how you can actually approach PCOS? Oh, where, where, do, where do I begin with this one? Um, so the, the conventional approach or conventional treatment for PCOS across the board is birth control. Um, and I will preface this by saying um, I'm by no means anti-birth control. I am always respectful um, of any any individual's decision, um, you know, in their autonomy to make a choice that feels really great for them. But pretty much across the board, uh, birth control is kind of given out as the first line of intervention for treatment in our, our healthcare system. Alongside that, other medications like metformin for the blood sugar um, and ovulatory issues, uh, spironolactone for some of the androgen issues um, are really commonly given out to women. The conventional approach is focused on symptom suppression. So with the birth control, if we have irregular cycles, we're kind of, you know, shutting down the production of our, our own hormones and, and kind of putting a little bit of a Band-Aid on it. And again, it's not that there's never a time and place where, you know, these things would be appropriate, but through a functional medicine lens, um, we want to understand more deeply what is preventing regular ovulation? Um, you know, what is creating uh, these symptoms in the body? And the, the cool thing about PCOS is, as you heard me describe some of those root causes with blood sugar, gut issues, you know, cortisol, inflammation, these things are highly, highly influenced by nutrition, lifestyle, you know, nutraceuticals. 
Um, so the the approach that we take is um, really trying to understand those PCOS root causes and the imbalances that are driving symptoms um, and really supporting the body with um, you know, the nutrition, the lifestyle, the nutraceuticals to bring bring things back to balance, um, which is a very, very effective approach. And, you know, that can also happen with or without some of these medications, depending on what the individual, um, you know, chooses is, is right for them. And I think the, the big issue I have with the conventional approach is that women are told this is your only option. And that is very frustrating. So if they are told that, that doesn't sound like there's much hope, right? Because it's just like, I would assume too, uh, it's very, you, we have to manage this. We have to manage this. You have to manage this. There's no hope. You're always going to be stuck with this. Is it possible to recover from this or go into remission or to possibly see it disappear as part of your health journey? It is 100% possible. And I do not take that statement lightly. Um, but it is very possible to address those root causes to support the body and get things to a place where the PCOS is essentially in remission, meaning we are not experiencing these chronic symptoms. We have, you know, regular cycles, regular ovulation with, you know, minimal symptoms. Um, it is very, very possible to get to that place where we are not um, chronically dealing with symptoms, constantly preoccupied with thinking about PCOS and food and this and that. Um, and, you know, it's everyone's journey will look a little bit different, um, but it's very, very possible. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just it's frustrating that women are not given that information. But I hope that provides a little bit of, of hope to anyone out there with PCOS that's struggling to know that there is so much opportunity um, to really eliminate and put um you know, those, those symptoms at bay. So we're not experiencing them day to day. I think that is really helpful for people to hear because when you don't know that there is a possibility of shifting things for yourself, it can be very depressing, you know? And that's what I find with chronic skin problems is that some individuals have just been told, sorry, you need to learn how to manage this and that's it. And they don't know that there are other ways to possibly address it or support their body. And to know that sometimes is just really, it's a really powerful place because now all of a sudden you realize there's hope. There's actually hope here. Um, I want to make sure that everyone can find you. So first of all, Jillian has a great podcast that she co-hosts. It's called Your Body Has Your Back and it's available on all podcasting platforms, correct? Yes. Perfect. And we'll make sure to link that up. And then you can also find her over on her website. Um, Jillian, can you share with us what that is? And, and if there's any other places that everybody should connect with you? Yeah, so um, you can find me on my my website at um, JillianGreaves.com. And you can also uh, find me on Instagram over on social media, um, hanging out there. And my handle is uh, at JillianGreavesRD. Perfect. Perfect. We'll link to all of this in the show notes. That way people can find you. And thank you so much for being here and for sharing so much information in our in our inaugural PCOS episode. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And uh, we'll have to have you come back sometime. Amazing. Thank you so much. I promise to share more PCOS content on this show. So if you have a specific question or topic you'd love for me to cover, let me know in the comments. To see the full transcript and resources from this episode, everything is in the full post over at skinterrupt.com forward slash 308, which I will link for you in the description below. And if this episode was helpful, hit that thumbs up and the subscribe button so you never miss the daily content shared on my channel. Thanks so much for joining me and I'm excited to dive deeper with you in the next episode. 